All right, so uh, week number two, uh, we will continue the discussion we began last week. Um, of course, last week was more of a general introduction um, to the course uh, and to the main topics presented in the textbook. Um, and now we will move on um, to a broader analysis of uh, the topic we discussed. So let's just do a, a brief summary before we continue. So a few things about the course. Again, it's a 15-week course um, entirely online. Um, and this will mean that we will have uh, the opportunity to interact mostly through uh, video lectures, interactive activities, um, assignments, quizzes. And as I mentioned last week, uh, a relatively big part of this course will be uh, social media based. And we will utilize social media, especially YouTube, in order to open up the discussion and the debate uh, on the topics that each week uh, we will be uh, analyzing. We also talked about the general framework utilizing this course, which will be a framework that is critical in the context of neuroscience coming from two different perspectives. So critical in a medical clinical sense and critical in a epistemological and philosophical sense. We also talk about the difference and separation between mind and matter. And if you remember, I uh, advise students to further research uh, some of the general uh, philosophical background in that area also recommending um, other books that um, deeply analyze this component, especially in the context of the application of philosophy in medicine. Um, think about medical philosophy as a book. Uh, today we will continue with the discussion uh, of neuroscience and I would like to uh, dig a little deeper into the existential component of uh, this field. So why do we study uh, critical neuroscience? Well, if we were to sum up with just one question, the main focus of this course, the question would be, are we our mind or are we our brain? Um, are mind and brain separate? And does our soul exist as in a separate entity from our brain or our body? This will be the main question. Now, of course, um, this question appears to bear more significance, value, and weight in the context of, let's say, uh, certain branches of medicine. Think about palliative care, end-of-life care, uh, as well as um, psychology or uh, psychiatry, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, uh, branches where the very notion of life, meaning, and purpose plays a fundamental role. But what I would like to say is that critical neuroscience is so important because it has to do with a lot of other related fields, even fields that appear to be simply uh, mechanistically intended. Think about surgery, for instance, where you might wonder slightly less about the importance of the existence of a soul, for instance. And yet, because the very question, are we who we claim to be, has such an important weight on ethical aspects, and those ethical aspects are the very core of, of the law, but also, uh, from our perspective, they, they play an essential role in advanced directives, as in who makes the decision for us, how can we um, decide who is responsible, as in has full capacity, uh, ability to understand, and is the difference between these two. Those are all related topics that can only be fully understood or I'd rather say better understood, we don't claim to fully understand everything at all times either, by questions such as who are we? Where can we find our conceptualization of self? Now, I also mentioned last week that this course does not attempt to uh, resolve the problem, but in a strictly etymological sense, we provide solutions so that we can solve, as in a chemical, or I dare to say alchemical sense, these uh, knots, these questions, because the very attempt to solve them, to resolve them, is in itself predicated upon these double hermeneutics. We already mentioned last week, double hermeneutics is this um, process, think about the philosopher Anthony Giddens, uh, in which the observer becomes the observed, the observing scientist becomes the observed item. Okay, And that's what many uh, aspects of um, therapeutic sciences, medical science, psychotherapy, uh, psychiatry, um, as well as you know, medical science in general uh, or social sciences in general uh, are predicated upon. So, um, 
we already discussed a brief introduction to the course. So let's go back to what we can say uh, in terms of basic uh, neurological structures. Again, this will be a general overview. Uh, we will talk about this multiple times. We will also uh, analyze brain structure and function, but for now, just a general overview. So how do we know what do we know about the brain? Well, a good introduction to uh, neuroscience will be a basic understanding of what the brain is and what system the brain is part of. So we can start by a general brief review of uh, basic neuroanatomy uh, and function, so physiology um, in, in a mechanistic sense, okay? Um, as well as pathophysiology to, to understand what the problems might come in. So the, the basic start is, of course, the nervous system. And the nervous system understood as a combination of two main parts, the CNR, so the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. At the center of the central nervous system, of course, we identify the brain and the connection with the spinal cord, including the, um, the pons um, and the medulla oblongata. Now, if we think about the brain, we should think about four main structures to begin with, which we uh, identify as lobes, one, two, three, four, and each lobe has a specific um, anatomical structure and function associated with it. Now, for the longest time in neuroscience, the debate was uh, whether function dominated structure or whether structure dominated function. You've probably heard of terms such the functionalist, for instance. And it's a debate that's somewhat similar to what we said last week about mind over matter, whether uh, our perspective should be entirely dualistic, so duos, two separate things, mind and matter, uh, structure and function, or should be monis from monos, from the Greek for one, so one thing only. Um, in this sense, we could also think that those connections between one and the other might be porous, there might be some sort of transparency, translucent element, or even um, some transfer between the two, um, where one controls the other, so mind over matter, or matter over mind, or there also could be a third element, which very often is identified as a third other. Now, in, in philosophical or spiritual sense, this otherness is very often identified as a spiritual component, as a transcendental component, as a god. So I do have my mind as a person, okay? And depending what background the person might, might uh, be familiar with, this mind is more or less associated with uh, psychological processes or a conceptualization of self, okay, this is my mind. On the opposite side, I have all my body, of which the brain eats but a, a part, albeit a, a part that plays a controlling role. But then there's a third element that is separate from either of these two, which very often is associated with God, for instance, or the gods. Okay? So when, when we think about um, things such as um, uh, locus of control and locus of responsibility, okay, this third part plays a role. So let's see what, what we mean by that. So we said that the brain is part of the central nervous system. Okay? And we also mentioned there are four main lobes, starting with the um, frontal lobe, the um, uh, parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, those four lobes. So each lobe plays a role in terms of structure and function, but they all communicate with one another, okay? So I might have a, um, an input that enter the system, let's see, a, uh, an, an external stimulus, a, a stimulus uh, predicated upon sensation, for instance, sight, and then my occipital lobe will interpret that stimulus, it will send it to uh, my um, thalamic uh, areas, and from there it will be sent back to the, the cortex, uh, and the cortex will give me the, um, the resulting image. So we could argue that the, the, the central part of our brain, <coughs> uh, epithalamus, uh, hypothalamus and thalamus, are to some extent the central relay control mechanism computer of our brain, uh, and just as a computer, they sent out the image on a screen and the screen will give me awareness of what's happening. So the cortex, the external bark of the brain, is what makes us aware of what's going on. So in, in, a, in a philosophical question, when I'm asking the question, in a philosophical question, when I'm asking the question, in a philosophical sense, when I'm asking the question, how do I know what I know? A good answer to begin with would be, well, I know what I am aware of. Again, I know what I am aware of. 
Now, this does not solve the problem of this I. Who, who, who is this I? Okay, is it, is it separate? Is it, is it the limbic system? Is it what is it? But at least it gives me a computational sense to understand where I can say I know something. I know something. What is something is brought to my awareness. Now, a second level to that that will be connected to the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system to our limbs. Okay is whether this sense of awareness has a relay feedback mechanism that is subjected to veto power. So whether I could have the opportunity or um, ability to decide not to be aware of that. Now we will talk about this aspect when we will talk about selectivity problems in neuroscience. For instance, whether it makes sense to talk about selective attention or selective listening. Spoiler alert, of course it does make sense, but there's plenty of evidence to, to make the claim. But of course, whether the selection is a fully aware process, well, that remains to be seen. All right, so uh, separation between mind, matter, and this third element that very often is referred to as, as God. So when we are deciding something for ourselves, who is the deciding factor? Who is the deciding uh, person, we could say? And that's where the problem uh, becomes very, very interesting. Uh, it, it was interesting to begin with, in my mind, but when you ask specific questions, that's where, where, where things um, uh, appear in their uh, complexity and beauty, I dare to say. So who is in charge? Who is to blame? On one side, we have a sequence of, for lack of a better term for now, uh, analytical as in separated, as in um, um, intellectual, intellectualized items. Okay, so we, we, we see this as similar to this. Think about how our senses work. Um, also from a developmental standpoint, think about we recognize something if this something can fit a category that pre-existed in our brain. For instance, um, I, I just heard a, a siren, type of alarm, and this creates a response inside of me because I can categorize this either as identical to something I previously experienced or something that clashes against something I previously experienced. For instance, most of the time, uh, when you hear um, fire alarms or, or, or siren from, 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 from the police or firefighters and so on and so forth, ambulances, usually with some variation between countries and cultures, they tend to have tones that clash with our common uh, experience of music. They might they have semi-tones that, that appear to, for lack of a better term, bother us. Okay, There's some, something that doesn't quite match. Now, of course, some of, of those things are entirely predicated on culture, conditioning, and upbringing, okay? Where culture, of course, means the, the big scene with the whole sociological, anthropological standpoint. Um, conditioning in the psychological sense, and I would advise students to review uh, conditioning, both classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So all the work by Ivan Pavlov, uh, with the salivating dog, all the way to uh, B.F. Skinner, and Watson, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, on the other side, the opposite as in upbringing. So if we're talking about upbringing, there is a, an element, a person that brings a person up and a person that is brought up. So again, uh, to some extent, this, this hermeneutic sense, this, uh, this sense of rediscovery. And when we think about, again, our sense of awareness, we just mentioned computational awareness, as in an awareness that can be uh, quantified in, in mathematical terms with numbers, more or less, okay, with a specific um, with a specific value. So if I'm brought up, I'm I have been brought up in an environment that contains a selective modality. So again, this selection, a selective modality that makes a judgment. So from a neuro neurological standpoint, from a broader neuroscientific standpoint, we discriminate all the time. We discriminate in terms of allowing a certain amount of stimulus to become aware in a specific sense. In classical example, we discriminate between different tones of green, for instance, if you think about colors. We discriminate between different notes in a musical sense. We even discriminate between different values in terms of volume and so on and so forth. We're able to select and put things in categories. The more those categories, those boxes 
exist. If we are aware of them, the more we can put it in. We also discriminate to leave things outside of the box. For instance, I might have a cognitive box for um, carrots and another one for potatoes, for instance. So what I'm going to do if I encounter kale, and if I, since we're in Vermont, we will encounter kale, then I might have a common box where each of these items can be all uh, can all belong to the same one, so they're all vegetables, but I, I will discriminate, I will have the ability to select and put things in separate boxes, one for carrots, one for kale, and one for potatoes. Now this brings us back to what we said a few minutes ago <clears throat> about locus, locus of control and locus of responsibility. <clears throat> Those are terms that <clears throat> are often used in, in psychology, in medicine, in philosophy, in economics, uh, as well in, 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 in common law, in, in, in intersection between these fields when we think about, uh, again, advanced directives. What can we say about that? Well, in general, what locus, of course, it's, it's, it's a Latin, uh, old Italic term for, for, for place. It's, it's related to um, um, other Indo-European uh, terms, um, containing the, um, the, the morphoneme LEUK, L -E -U -K, which indicates both a place, a place of light, a place in Latin, light itself, so it's a cognate of lux in Latin, uh, of light in English, licht in German, and so on and so forth. And it's, it's, it's a place both in a synonymic sense, in a, in a um, morphological sense, in a figurative sense, it's a place. Okay? And control and responsibility are the two venues, the two outlets that this locus can take. So, as an example, we can think of locus of control and locus of responsibility as being internal or external. For instance, a person that has an internal locus of control thinks that uh, he or she is able to uh, have a certain control on certain tasks, for instance, and outcomes, more important. So, in uh, his or her life. Example, um, I uh, am studying for a quiz. If I have a full internal locus of control, I can control, that's at least how I, I interpret um, the, the scenario, the outcome. I have control, okay? So the, the results on my quiz are entirely predicated on my ability to memorize this, the concept that will be listed as part of the multiple choice questions in the quiz. I have control. In other words, I don't have this idea that doesn't matter what I study, it is beyond my control what is going to be the outcome in the quiz. That would be external control, okay? Now, what happens when I got the quiz back? And let's say I, I got um, a, I got a bad grade. I got a, a C minus in the quiz. All right. Um, if I have an internal locus of responsibility, well, as the name implies, I will be feeling, thinking that I am fully responsible for that outcome. In other words, either I did not study enough, or maybe I didn't sleep well. It is my quote unquote 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 fault for having um, this C minus, we would say, uh, as a result of the quiz. If instead I have an external locus or responsibility, I might be more prone to think that doesn't matter how much I study, um, it's, it's, it's beyond my responsibility, the fact that I got a bad grade. It was the instructor that was too tough, or the, the, I, the, the, the course did not list what topic uh, I was supposed to study, so I didn't prepare myself enough. So it's not quote unquote unquote my fault. The reason why I keep saying quote unquote unquote is because concepts such as fault and guilt um, are, are much more complex than just you know this this overall discussion on on um, logic or low side form. So between these two poles, internal and external, a, a whole array of sense of self uh, becomes important. So on one side, you have all these neurological matter-based components. So um, the, in the mind-body uh, problem, the ultimate question is who does what or what does what, what does whom? Okay? So is it the brain in control or is it my mind in control? And to push things a little further, if it is my brain, then uh, we talk about this in, 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 um, in psychology all the time, and, and there is a video that talks about that um, in the context of depression that I advise um, all of you to take a look at, 
um, the more we are prone to think that the brain is everything about itself, the more we might feel temporarily uh, excused, if I permit the term, uh, for feeling or thinking uh, in a certain way, but at the same time, we don't have enough power or as we want to use the term, control of our life. The opposite is true if you think that it's all in our mind and you know my neurotransmitter, my genetic makeup uh, does not play as much of a role. So locus of control and locus of responsibility. Now, of course, going back to what we said about structure versus function in the brain, the brain itself is a multitude of things all working together. The, the brain is like an orchestra, it's a beautiful, um, ensemble of, of multiple things that are kept together, that interact, and each feed information and inputs and outputs to the to the neighboring areas and very often to areas that are opposite, neurotomically speaking, to uh, to provide a broader picture. Um, and if you think about the, the brain, in these terms, the, 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 the classical name that comes to mind is Phineas Gage, G A G E. Um, in Cavendish, Vermont, um, and th that represents one of the earliest examples um, within um, neuroscience, specifically within neuroanatomy, to define the role of the frontal lobes in, um, in the production, uh, sequencing, and um, external manifestation of emotions. Um, so, long story short, um, in 1800, uh, this Phineas Gage was working <coughs> on a train line in Cavendish, Vermont, and there was a big explosion and a rod pierced uh, through his skull, and uh, he was uh, injured, he lost sight uh, on one eye, um, but he was able to maintain um, motor function uh, properties as before. Well, you know, there was some, some rehab, but he, he, he didn't change in that area. What changed about him was, of course, uh, um, his emotions and uh, the, the way he interacted with others. So from an ethical and moral standpoint, people claim that he became more umbertal, he became more um, inappropriate, um, and, and, and his whole personality changed. So that in itself um, gave us two basic pieces of information. One, that the brain is not just one organ, okay, but there, it's, it's very specific in its areas, and two, that is very sensitive in terms of which area uh, is affected, but at the same time has a lot of resilient self to be able to uh, select that part is injured and still allow everything else to work properly. And so when we think about in body cognition, when we think about the ability to understand that the body has a different language mechanism than our mind, we think of it as multiple parts that interact just as an orchestra. Um, I dare to say that this is a very holistic uh, perspective on things, a perspective that makes us part of a whole, a very nurturing perspective, a very encouraging perspective as well, but it's also a perspective that really makes a lot of scientific sense. We are parts that work together. And to push in a little further, um, things that we will be discussing when we talk about artificial intelligence, we could even make this claim that there is an externalization and uh, universalization of self to the point that certain computational elements of our mind processes, our psychological processes, don't even require a physical body to exist. Classical example, well, the internet, computers. Our knowledge is shared even beyond the domain of organic chemistry, you could say, but by virtue of you know better understanding um, um, binary codes and computer technology and HTML coding and so on and so forth. So the internet, it's, it's, it's a non-localized brain. It's a type of brain that exists everywhere, but at the same time, physiologically speaking, really nowhere. Now, I am very critical um, of certain branch of neuroscience that claim that therefore, so there's a, there's a, it's not just a correlation, it's a causal effect, therefore, our computers, modern day computers, are better than human beings, better than human brains. Well, th this doesn't really make sense ontologically speaking to me. It doesn't make sense in essence, okay, ontology, right? Um, simply because we have to define these parameters. What do we mean by better? Well, if by better we simply mean sheer speed of information processing, well, we human beings already lost the battles in the mid 80s against computers. 
um, just because computers do what they're supposed to do. They, there are computational machines that are called computers from the Italic or Latin language for, for, for computation, from calculation, right? Um, and, and therefore, they are much faster than any uh, any average human beings, I dare to say, um, to do pretty much anything uh, and to, to do it much better in terms of uh, precision and speed. Whether computation is the only parameter, well, I, I, I beg to differ in a big, big sense. Um, and, and plus, when we think about better, uh, the term better, it's in, in itself a qualitative value, not a quantitative one. Albeit, we could make the case that when we when we utilize hierarchies and we have numbers that we utilize in these hierarchies, numbers that can be predicated upon the utilization of Likert scales. Now, of course, there are reasons why qualitative studies and quantitative studies merge because we associate a number. And yet, the reasoning beyond associating a number is in itself not entirely computationally based. Even in those more extreme cases, we when we delegate an algorithm to do the work for us. But again, we will discuss that um, when we talk about a brain computer interface, uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and uh, digital technologies. Okay, wonderful. Uh, but before we uh, continue with our discussion on, again, this comparative analysis between human beings and, and computers and so on and so forth, uh, let's go back to the main uh, concept of this uh, chapter. So we are uh, moving toward chapter two because the first one was just the introduction. And chapter two has to do with the exact science of the hard matter. What, what does it mean? Well, it means that there is an assumption that uh, we all have to make uh, just because it's part of our uh, cultural framework. The assumption is that um, we are working on hard science, right? So hard science as in neuroscience, a science that is empirically verifiable and therefore it falls uh, into the, the, the big umbrella of the principle of falsifiability and the principle of falsifiability simply means that a theory, a hypothesis rather, can be tested to verify whether it's true or false. So it's a binary uh, type of response, yes or no. Uh, and for everything else, we need to um, account in terms of uh, variable, uh, covariables, et cetera, et cetera, intrinsic explicit bias, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, let's see what uh, the introduction to, the, uh, to this chapter, to chapter two, has to say again. Uh, exact science of the hard matter. Now, hard matter, of course, has also to do with the intrinsic value of our brain, the brain as an organ, the brain as something that is constructed in order to perform a series of tasks. Now, uh, the textbook says that uh, one of the general aspects is a question. How, how reliable is philosophy in comparison to science? Now, is this question even a valid one? It, does it have to be uh, a, a, a comparison as in a distinction between philosophy and science? After all, philosophy, uh, I'm sure I'm the first one to mention this, it's love of science, but as well as science of love, right? Philosophare. Uh, but the point that uh, this chapter is trying to make is, is it rational, is it warranted to utilize philosophy as a method to investigate science, specifically neuroscience? Now, <clears throat> there is something to be said about the distinction and the connection. The textbook says this question has been posed under the assumption according to which those two fields are very separate, both in terms of history and epistemological essence, especially in regard to methodologies and goals, and B, philosophy, especially in the context, that is, theoretical framework or mindset, of analytic philosophy, which sees itself as a support of science, particularly hard science to shed light or clarify assumptions, ideas, and thoughts, often relying on formal logic and cognitive structure used in natural science. Now, this is not the time and place to um, further investigate this distinction between uh, analytic philosophy on one side and continental philosophy on the other side. But if you are interested, these two terms really have to do more with uh, cultural, geographic, um, perspective rather than, I dare to say, uh, a significant opposition, despite the fact that the outcome is very different. So, continental philosophy, of course, refers to continental Europe, uh, 
uh, specifically the traditional areas of philosophical, uh, philosophical inquiry, so uh, Germany, or, or rather I should say probably Prussia, uh, given the, the context of this German Empire, um, as well as um, France, to some minor extent, because of course with, with France you can find a whole separate area of philosophical investigation that might be closer to analytic philosophy. And analytic philosophy, of course, has to do more with uh, the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth. Uh, a general assumption of the distinction between continental and uh, analytic philosophy is A, what the purpose of philosophy is. So in analytic philosophy, as we've just seen, it's more of a support to further declare uh, and investigate labels that pertain to uh, science versus in, um, in continental philosophy, um, philosophy itself is a distinct and um, self-affirming field. Uh, there's some time contrast with this type of scientism. Now, uh, let's continue. Um, whether we are to support such assumption or reject it under, for instance, ideas from general content of philosophy, postmodernism, deconstruction, deconstructivism, traditionalism, perennialism, and so on, we could ask ourselves whether such assumption could at least be useful to investigate the core concept we are discussing here, namely the connection between mind and brain and the possible neural underpinnings of cognition, memory, perception, consciousness, and behavior. Consciousness in particular appears to be the connecting link between multiple disciplines in the attempt of just explaining the most basic ontological questions related to this complex concept. Now, in, in, in this specific area, I would like to, uh, again, stress the um, connection between consciousness, conscience, and cognition. Now, of course, being conscious about something has to do with the level of awareness. And from our perspective, the, the neurological one, this, as we said, has to do with uh, computational analysis, or at least ha it has to do with uh, numerical values. We have to put things on a hierarchical structure. We have to assign specific numbers to level of consciousness. Um, in terms of the awareness of self in the context we could also push the term conscientiousness and this is a term that uh, the ones of you that are familiar with uh, psychology specifically uh, psychology of personality and personality disorders are most likely familiar with the big five uh, personality model um, and you know conscious conscientiousness as a predictor for instance of of a certain element within uh, job performance, uh, job satisfaction, as well as career. Now, conscience has also to do with an element of investigation. After all, it is in itself based on a gnostic model. By gnostic, I mean gnosis per se, so the epistemological element has to be based on science. There is a combination of science and self-awareness, okay? Now, let's continue. Um, Donald Fildoran thoroughly analyzed the work by Hegel. Um, Hegel, of course, uh, the, the German uh, philosopher, Gottfried Friedrich Hegel, especially in regard to the possibility of understanding consciousness. <clears throat> As we have seen, according to this interpretation of the German philosopher, the two moments of Ansicht are brought together by the work of consciousness. However, this is a constant battle because of the very nature of Ansicht, we contain the very essential of the epiphenomenon. Given that we are talking about phenomenology of the spirit, the Ansicht is therefore a positive object or event in existence with the absence of sense or perception, coded in sense, perception, and understanding, representing the three failed attempts to bridge the gap between these opposites, we can, we can, which cannot be apprehended as a function of the object, but they lead to self-certain truth. All right, so <clears throat> this is quite important because um, aside from Hegelian perspective on phenomenology, on external manifestation of existence, uh, I want to stress how, how important the concept of concept is. So what is concept? Concept is something we can grasp. Concept is something that is manifested and of course, there is an element of ontological value. So one of the questions that I would like students to think about, um, whether they are followers of Hegel or not, is how can we grasp what we grasp? 
how can we know what we know? But we have to be very specific. Uh, paradoxically speaking, we have to be less theoretical, less uh, philosophical and much more pragmatic. How do we know? Well, we know well one possible answer according to uh, neural underpinnings of behavior is we know what we know because we can monitor it, because we can uh, relate to it and because we can talk about it, manifest something about it. And this is a type of knowledge that you might argue is predicated upon our senses. Something enters the system, something enters our brain, there's an input and then because there is this input and because we have uh, you know, structures uh, within the hypothalamus that allow us to uh, encode, decode uh, and, and amplify just as a, as a guitar amplifier this content uh, to make it awareness in our uh, cortical areas, then we grasp this concept. In other words, we, we might argue that something does not exist unless this something strikes our attention, unless this something is entering our sphere of understanding. Now, of course, this is separate from the object in itself, whether there is an item, an object that exists as a separate entity from our understanding. Now, <clears throat> let's continue. Um, of course, the search for the truth is dialectical even beyond the Hegelian conception and somewhat akin to the usage of the term in dialectic behavioral therapy or in sociopolitical discourse aimed at mitigating or at least making sense of two opposites. Now, <clears throat> this might be just a, a summary for, for some of you, but if you think about Hegelian dialectic, um, according to the model by Gottfried Friedrich Hegel, you have thesis on one side, which, which, which in our case will be the, the, the scientific premise, um, antithesis on the opposite side, and of course the synthesis between these two. Now there's a plenty of uh, uh, philosophical debate about whether the synthesis is cumulative, is uh, democratic in a sense of finding a place between these two poles, or is something third, different altogether. It's a um, overcoming, uh, superimposing, um, going beyond both thesis and antithesis. But a commonality between this assumption and what we do in therapy is the fact that we, as human beings, can ponder the world and, and, and using an inner balance to make sense of two opposite poles inside of us. Now, this is extremely fundamental when we think about the mind-body connection. We already mentioned that, at least in theory, and we'll see if this, this hypothesis is, is warranted or not, we could look at this distinction between mind and body, right? So on one side you have a mind, on the other side you have a body or, or brain. Now, the mind, we might argue, for the time being, has its own way to interpret the world. And again, depending which direction you can take, mind as in psychological process, this might have to do with a um, form of self-understanding or uh, vicarious understanding by, by, by virtue of talking to someone. Or, or mind can be something more spiritual, mind as in soul, uh, for which uh, less cognitive investigation is even needed and you might uh, find out more about yourself through uh, prayer, meditation, and enlightenment, and so on and so forth. So one side you have this mind, and on the other side you have, of course, the body, which is, again, predicated on biological, biochemical, uh, electromagnetic processes, and so on and so forth, that, of course, has its own um, language, its own uh, processes. Now, those two things can be separate, they are distinct, but it can coexist. Now, this goes back to what we said um, last week about the mind-body problem per se. Is it my brain or is it my body? Is the question, did my brain make me do it a logical one? Well, we could say that the ability to keep two things in place makes us more integrated. And this integration, uh, I dare to say, has to do with a lot of uh, um, psychotherapeutic, psychodynamic, psychoanalytic work. You know, the first thing I can, can, can think of is, is, is the work by, um, by Jung, uh, by Carl Jung um, on one side, but also other works within humanistic and, and, and positive psychology, um, all the way to motivational interviewing, uh, where this ability to be self-integrated, 
the ability to be the opposite, disintegrated, makes sense. It's, it's the ability to uh, navigate, to navigate complexity in life, to, to ride the tiger, we could say, to uh, be able to face the waves of destiny, to, to live an existence that keeps these two poles, not necessarily at bay, but it keeps these two poles in place by pulling and pushing back, uh, creating a current, an electromagnetic field. So see how the interesting thing here is, uh, the electromagnetic field, which is one of the essential factor of, of neural transmission that allow you know, um, um, neural imaging, brain imaging to occur. Um, and I don't, I'm not thinking only about you know an, an electroencephalograms, but thinking about the whole neuroimaging field, and we will see that in, in the following chapters, all the way from, from, from fMRI to SPECT and so on and so forth. So th there is a neurological element and this, this electromagnetism. And on the other side, you have this magnetism between two opposites. That is exactly what dialectic behavioral therapy does. There is a dialectic, there's a continuum, conversation, communication, a mutual exchange of factors. Now, I don't want to push this Hegelian perspective on the work by Marsha Linehan, who is the author of uh, DBT, Dialectic Behavioral Therapy, but from the perspective of our um, question, the question of existence, um, of um, mind and matter, this makes total logical sense. So let's continue for a few minutes on the very first part of chapter two, and then we will move on to uh, the second part, which will have to do with neuroanatomy. Now, to <coughs> conclude uh, the, this first uh, portion of, of um, the introduction to chapter two, the exact science of the uh, hard matter, let's, um, let, let's think about this concept of going back and forth, right? So this, this, this swinging between poles, between opposites. We could think of the mind-brain uh, mind problem at the center of critical neuroscience. More specifically, we are thinking of epistemological efforts to justify biologically, for instance, the natural emergence in evolutionary economic terms of human morality, or on the opposite view, to claim that human morality is in itself enough proof of the existence of a divine maker. We can think of swinging on exercise ball platform to increase the core mass of the abdomen as a metaphor for trying to balance the absurd or conflicting views, for instance, science versus religion, or the absence of any values or universal principles. Following this metaphor, the opposite is someone who melts on a rigid but stable platform, i.e. people who blindly follow dogmas to make themselves feel at ease. In any case, we would need to define the parameters of an illusion or self, delusion of existence. This act of redefining or relearning the deep meaning of morality, in the example above, we could be faced with a two-word self centered movement, emerges intuition, self-consciousness of self, which in the Hegelian analysis represent the primary path to a truth which is A, absolute, and B, beyond illusion, beyond illusion as in interpreted under the framework of Jenseits. So German for, for this side of the equation, this side of the um, um, immanent as opposed to transcendental equation. Okay, so uh, not the, the opposite of, of, of afterlife. This path leads to the true meaning, or meaning, right, in a Hegelian sense, which allows this emergence truth to emerge from both consciousness as sleep and sleep of consciousness through the Unglücklichkeit of skeptical stoic perspective. This is the linguistic and meaning making, make meaning originating phase before the reabsorption of the self affirming consciousness based reality into the Verkehrte Welt. Now, this is very, very deep, uh, not, not because <laughs> the book states it as it is, but it's, 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 it's profound as it's, it's complex and it's really hard to uh, distinguish all these parameters unless someone um, that is very, very interested in Hegelian philosophy uh, has also a profound knowledge how to, to utilize this term appropriately. But for the time being, I want to review what, what we said so far. So 
the general assumption is this there are two opposites and these two opposites need to communicate not because there is a moral or, or ethical need for them to do so but because we need to understand whether there is a connection between these two terms uh, to begin with the textbook in this context is using a metaphor a metaphor of again either electromagnetic field uh, uh, current or, or, or exercise where you you, you work in your, your your core your abdomen in a um, in, in a gym or so on and so forth to make this claim. It's a metaphor that connects this, this current, this field to the ability to find something that is third, that's different than the two opposites. It's similar to what will happen if two individuals have a conversation. I am sharing something, you in front of me share something with me and then the commonality um, is something that is created as a result of the communication. Now be careful here, by commonality we do not mean that I am giving up something that I, uh, for instance, consider uh, worthy or, 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 or I believe as necessary or, or, the same, or the opposite person will do the same. What we're trying to say here is that it is only by virtue of sharing existing in, in, in the sense of mutual presence, coexisting that this third element is created. What I share and what you share, it's not as much as what the communication between the two of us will allow for. Okay, uh, so the, the, the usual uh, saying, the 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 the, 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 the holistic perspective, that the hollows is more than the sum of its parts, right? And in terms of intrinsic knowledge, this is exactly what is expected to be. Now I, I will stop here for a second, but one other thing that I, I feel I should mention is that a lot of studies that have been done in the context of prayer and meditation, uh, transcendental, um, uh, mystical, spiritual activities are indeed not predicated about what we just said, but they're the demonstration, they're to say they are the proof of the validity of such claims. Uh, if you are interested, um, two um, uh, scientists I can think of on top of my mind for now, are um, Erika Poli, who is a psychiatrist uh, and psychotherapist and researcher in Milan, Italy, and the other one is uh, Mario Beauregard, who is a neuroscientist um, in Montreal, uh, Quebec. Um, and a lot of this research is fascinating because it clearly in identifies neural processes as changing um, as part of these transcendental access to a divine element. Now at, at this stage of course we're not gonna talk about um, theological elements, whether this divine element is uh, theologically sound as in identifiable with God or not, but, but the point I'm trying to make is that there is a an opening up of different neural processes when a person is entering that meditative, uh, spiritual, uh, praying um, transcendental uh, realm and those activities are very very different uh, from everything else they're uh, intrinsically different from uh, uh, awake wakeful cognitive processes when a person is thinking about um, how to solve an equation or or it's using selective memory to um, recall um, the proper answer to a question a quiz they're also very different uh, from um, um, REM phases, uh, sleeping patterns in general. Um, they're different from the quote-unquote twilight zone, so uh, hypnopompic and hypnagogic phases where, where you, you, you wake up in the morning or you fall asleep at night. They're intrinsically uh, different and we're only talking about neurological factors here. So uh, the least we can do is that, again, going back to this current uh, between these two poles, there is something third that exists, uh, something third that make us uh, more aware of the fact that the brain is receiving and reinterpreting signals, the nature of which have at this stage uh, possibly nothing to do with the brain itself. Um, but let's stop here for a second and we will continue with um, neuroanatomy, which is the first subfield that we will discuss in this chapter, chapter two. Wonderful. So uh, let us stop here uh, for now. This uh, is again the introduction to um, the um, to, to to the first real chapter of the textbook. Uh, 
So as an assignment, I would like you to uh, write a little comment, a little post um, below this video uh, regarding this existential question. Um, if the basic question of this course could be summed up as in, are we our brain or are we our mind? How would you answer this question? Again, this would be a question that will follow us, accompany us throughout the semester. So I will ask you the same question at different times, but with this bare, basic introductory knowledge, um, I would like to hear your thoughts. So please, as they say in social media, comment below and let me know your thoughts in regard to this um, existential question. Thank you.